Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome to webinar number three in the romantic webinar series. So if you are in, go ahead and uh, let me know that you can hear me. Enter, enter your name or say hello, like in the chat and let me know whether or not uh, you can hear me. So go ahead and enter your information. Uh, just say hello. Let me know that you can hear me okay. Okay, I see that there are some people who are in fact showing up. That is good. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to webinar number three. The do's and don'ts of divorce. Uh, I've lined up uh, an exciting uh, series for you today, and uh, I hope that you will enjoy it. It's really designed to help you um, really improve the quality of your relationship, no matter what kind of relationship that you're in, particularly if you're in a romantic relationship. Uh, this one focuses particularly on romantic relationships um, as the series uh, is uh, titled. So that's what we are endeavoring uh, to do today. We focus on divorce uh, because it is, it is a very, very real thing uh, in reference to, to relationships. And when I sent out the invitation and I posted the information, uh, you may have seen the, uh, the statement or the description, which says no one, no one gets married with the intention of divorce. No one really uh, does that but it happens it happens so today we want to look at at uh, why that happens what's what some of the contributing factors are and possibly what are some things that can be done to address the issue of either staving off uh, divorce eventually uh, or uh, even if you're contemplating divorce what are some of the things that you can do to perhaps uh, put it off for a while or improve the uh, the nature of the relationship and uh, is there a time when you in fact should get divorced and uh, that answer comes up comes up here in just a little bit so go ahead and say uh, whether or not uh, you can hear me okay and um, uh, let's see are you hearing me I see several people are saying hello can you can you both hear and see me um, because I want to make sure that um, the the you can see me and you can hear me um, as well. So if you can hear and see, then uh, let me know. Let me just double check something here to make sure that, um, okay, I think this is set up the way I want it set up. And um, okay, so let's, um, let's jump in. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, Welcome, I'll give it just another few seconds here uh, before we go ahead and um, dive in headlong with what it is um, I want to address here today. So let me uh, begin to share my information with you here in just a second. Let's see if I can uh, share my screen. I will do that here in just a bit so that you will be able to um, see. So let's see if I'm going to do that here and you will be able to, oops, did I do that right? Let me make sure I did that um, correctly. Hang on. Make sure I did that correctly. Uh, hang on a second. I'm messing something up here. Give me a minute here. I will get it sorted out. I did have it sorted out in practice. It worked perfect. Uh, let's try. Okay. And okay, should be working fine. Let's let's try that again and see. Okay, 
I think we are there. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to um, Helpful Hasty's Romantic Relationship Webinar Series. This is webinar number three. Uh, webinar number one, uh, we address the issue. Uh, in fact, that webinar was titled, uh, When It Comes to Love, Less is More. And that recording um, is available in the archives for those of you who are interested in getting it. Uh, and last month, webinar um, number two, got a little bit deeper into the series to move beyond the issue of, of, of love or look at love in a, in a, in a different um, manner. Webinar number two was uh, titled, um, Do Not Marry for Love, Marry for Dot, Dot, Dot. Uh, again, after laying the foundation in webinar number one and talking about when it comes to love, less is more. For me, it was important then to go on to say, um, subsequently, don't marry for love. Marry for something else. And the thing that we talked about was really marrying for companionship. And between webinar number one and two, if you haven't seen those, uh, you really ought to uh, contact me about getting uh, the link uh, so I can send you to the archives uh, to get those materials because webinar number three will then move on in the series to address this issue, uh, as I said at the beginning, to address the issue of, of divorce. Divorce. So let's uh, let's jump right in and um, the do's and don'ts of divorce. And so for those of you who um, may not know me, most of you do. I can see from those of you who have signed in. Those are, those are names that I, I I recognize. Again, a number of my students are in the webinar. Welcome, welcome. Hope you had a successful semester. Now that this one is done. Uh, it was a different semester uh, for all of us uh, with having to do some things online. Uh, and I see also that there are some former students who are also in the webinar. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Dr. Sam Hasty, And let me begin by just highlighting some of the things that have uh, value to me. Uh, first and foremost, I am husband to wife Gaynell. Gaynell is my wife, has been for 34 years and hope it will be for another 340 years. Absolutely wonderful, wonderful. It's been a fascinating time, uh, particularly during quarantine, because as we will see here in just a minute, uh, there is something interesting to be said about uh, the effects of quarantine on marriages. And um, my wife and I talked about this a couple of days ago. Uh, and um, it was, it's, it's good. It's good to be able to spend even more time with her as we have been able to as a function of uh, the quarantine. So again, Gaynell is my wife and uh, have been. Um, and um, don't ever see that changing. Next, I am father to two daughters, particularly those of you who are students of mine, you know, I say I have two beautiful daughters who are also pretty. Um, Samantha is now 30. Uh, if she's on the webinar, she, I don't know, she's going to be embarrassed by that. I don't think she will. Uh, but she has a birthday coming up here uh, next month in June. And myself, by the way, uh, celebrated uh, my 60th birthday um, earlier this week. And um, it was good. It was a, it was a different time. I was planning to celebrate it with uh, many, many uh, more family members uh, out of town, but that's okay. That got delayed. Um, so we will do that uh, another time. But my Samantha is, uh, is 30, will be 31 here in another month or so. And um, my Ashley, my Ashley is 27. She will be 28 later this year. Again, two beautiful uh, daughters who are also pretty. I'm a Christian psychologist. And as I have explained in the past, this is important for me. So uh, trained as a psychologist and uh, trained, quite frankly, um, very, very well, had very, very good professors um, in all of my years of, of training of all levels, baccalaureate, um, master's and the doctoral uh, degrees, uh, saw so very, very good training. Uh, but I take great pride in saying that I am a Christian psychologist. And I met, as I mentioned um, in the last webinar, 
um, by a Christian psychologist. That does not suggest in any way that I'm going to ignore the science of psychology. Uh, but you will see here, uh, once again, that even as a Christian, I will fully embrace the science of psychology. But you will see coming through uh, my lens, my Christian views and perspectives. Uh, I will say uh, where I hold those Christian perspectives, and you don't necessarily have to agree with those, um, because what I want to share with you uh, very strongly, equally, is the science of relationships. And so you will see that come through. The college professors at Miami Dade College have been there now for uh, four years and have enjoyed every minute of it. I take great pride in the work that I do, particularly uh, great, great value in the students that I have. I'm very, very fortunate to have very, very good students. And um, uh, I am just indebted to my students for their dedication uh, to their training, particularly those who allow me to mentor them. And again, I am honored uh, to be asked by uh, a number of students to mentor them, and I take great pride in that. I'm an author, I've written one book. Uh, I've been writing a second book, <laughs> writing and writing and writing. It'll be done someday, but uh, I have authored so far one book. In the past, I've produced a, a television program called The Family Enrichment Hour, which was then followed on by a radio program called The Family Enrichment Minute. All of these are the works that I've done uh, for the past 30 years, uh, and I take Let's push ahead to today's presentation, the do's and don't of, uh, the do's and don'ts of divorce. Uh, and as usual, I like to begin with uh, our goal. Our goal is to examine the reasons and rationale for uh, divorce. So we're going to see some of the reasons um, that are generally given with the rationale, and then I'm going to ask in some ways, uh, does it make sense, the reasons we give or the rationales that we offer, and if so, why? And do we need then to implement some things when it comes to divorce, and uh, if so, what? And if not, why not? And when should those things not be implemented, if at all? So we'll have a look at that. But the question is first, who is this webinar for? And I think that's an important question because if you're going to look at this issue of divorce, and then one of the questions that makes sense, well, well, who should participate? Who's going to benefit from this? And, and I would say that married individuals are going to benefit from this because the truth of the matter is <laughs> divorce is only an issue after marriage. It's not an issue before marriage. I mean, it's an issue in as much as you might Think about whether or not you want to marry because uh, you might divorce, but until you are married, then divorce never becomes uh, an option. So it's for the marriage, but it's also for the divorced because there are individuals who get divorced. Again, as I said in the beginning, no one comes into marriage. No one goes into the, the wonderful institution of marriage saying, I'm going to get married, but you know what? Uh, after about, after about, Nine months, I'm, I'm, I'm out. No, no one really does it. Folk really, really do give it some thought. Now, part of what I will emphasize is greater thought needs to be given, and perhaps a different kind of thought needs to be given uh, to the issue of being married and divorce. But if you're divorced, um, welcome, because uh, you will learn something here uh, that will be of hope and encouragement and insight, uh, particularly if you ever contemplate remarriage. Very, very important for singles, because as you will see in the data um, that will be presented here in a little bit, uh, some interesting things have been happening uh, with the singles with respect to marriage and divorce uh, and their perspectives. Um, almost two decades now, we've seen some trends and some things that um, we should get excited about on the one hand and some things that perhaps might concern us on the other. So uh, for those of you who are single, or for those of you who know individuals who are single, for those of you who, like me, have kids who are of marrying age and still single, this is of great value uh, to them as well. 
And then notice that I have here highlighted in a red cohabiting. Those individuals who are cohabiting, I, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to share some things with you that I think you will find particularly interesting because, again, there's a reason why individuals end up in this cohabiting category as opposed to um, just being married or divorced. And what is interesting is that um, a number of individuals end up cohabiting after having been divorced. And so I want to look at uh, that. And again, I highlight that for a special reason because I think it, it, it's, that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a group of individuals that really, really need um, special attention. By special, I mean special in all of the uh, best possible, possible ways. So those are the individuals for whom um, this is intended. And um, if you're in the webinar, you fall into one of those uh, categories. Uh, the only one that isn't there is widowed. And you'll forgive me for having forgotten that, but uh, widowed would fall right into that, uh, that slide uh, as well. Next. What do you see on the screen? And because I'm attempting to do something there that some of you will recognize and some of you will not recognize, but it's my way of saying that as we talk about a divorce here, uh, uh, it's gonna come in a dichotomous view, right? There, there, there are at least two views that are going to, or two major views that are going to be presented here. And if you look at that screen uh, directly in front of you, uh, what do you see? For some of you, you see a chalice. Yeah, you see something that might resemble a, 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 a bird bath or a glass, uh, a wine glass or, or something like that. Uh, because that might stand out to most of you um, best first. But my question is, do you see the two faces facing each other? If you don't, try now. Maybe with a little more background, uh, you're able uh, to see. If you still are struggling with that, let me see if I can help you with that. This would be the top of the head, the back of the head, here's the neck, and right there, that nose. And then on the other side, top of the head, back of the head, and this chin right there. So, so that's my way of introducing this idea that uh, the view that's going to be presented here is, is, is two different views in general, in a very, very broad way. What are those two different views then? On the one hand, there's the sacred view. There's the sacred view. And by sacred, um, I'll get to that in just a second, but there's also the scientific view. And those two don't necessarily disagree, although sometimes we have put them at odds with each other, but they don't necessarily disagree, nor do they necessarily have to disagree. Uh, and I think it's equally important uh, especially for those of us who are Christians, to be able to have a sacred view, but also to have a scientific view. Uh, and now, when I talk particularly about the sacred view, it's really governed by biblical or, re or religious views. And, and again, for most of us who are Christians, our view of divorce is governed by, um, thus said the Lord, so to speak, what, we, what we've been taught according to Bible and what we've heard preached from the pulpit. Uh, it is also... Uh, sacred in terms of the do's and the don'ts are based on conservative versus liberal view of scripture. Now, conservative versus liberal has nothing to do with politics, okay? So not that kind of conservative versus liberal, but conservative in terms of even within uh, Christology, uh, there is a conservative view of things or more orthodox view of things. Or there is a more liberal view of things. And again, depending on which of those views you come from, uh, that's going to influence uh, the way in which uh, you look at divorce. So for example, from a very conservative view, if you have the conservative, particularly sacred view, then your belief is that there is only one reason for divorce and that one reason is infidelity. If however, you have on a, of a more liberal view, then your view uh, from that regard says, no, even from the guilty party in um, extramarital affair and my spouse wants to then divorce me, if I ask for forgiveness, then God is gracious and he will forgive me. In a nutshell and very quickly, that's the more liberal view, which quite frankly tends to be, tends to be 
the, 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 the more predominant view, even in the sacred school uh, of thinking. Now, don't want to get into that extensively because that's a webinar all by itself, uh, but perhaps um, another time uh, we will address that subject uh, exclusively. And when we talk about the sacred, <clears throat> um, it's not going to be, uh, or it will be addressed indirectly um, in this webinar. So again, as I said, you will see some of my personal views perhaps coming in. And I hope I remind myself to tell you when my personal views are coming in, particularly based on my uh, uh, Christian beliefs. On the other side of the ledger, there's the scientific view. I hold to the scientific view very strongly as well. So what does that mean? It's governed by sociological, anthropological, and psychological science. And so even in preparing for this webinar, uh, there is a lot of research that has gone into it. And I spent days and days, even before, just years and years of reading articles and, and studying theories and textbooks and sitting at the feet of learned men and women for many, many years. But even, even beyond that, just in the past uh, several weeks and preparing for some of this and looking at some of the more recent research that has been conducted that has been able to inform us and will inform us about some of the trends that are taking place. That's a scientific view. It's a scientific view. And so we're going to look at some of that um, as well. In fact, quite frankly, our view is going to be more scientific uh, than it will be sacred here this evening. But you will still see the sacred as it, as, it, as it comes through. Number two then, from a scientific standpoint, the do's and the don'ts are based on the research data. And so science is really all about the research. What does the research say? Um, and and it's, it's difficult to argue with research. Now, how the research gets interpreted might be something else altogether. So we'll look at some of that um, a little bit here. It will be addressed directly in this webinar. So that's where a lot of our focus will be. What I'm hoping to do is to present a blended or diversified view of divorce. And as such, uh, we're going to look at the decline in divorce. Uh, we're going to look at the materials and the myths of divorce. We're going to look at delay, not decline, and the increase in cohabitation. Cohabitation is on the increase. I'm going to look at that. I'm also going to look at what's the fix? What's the fix to this thing called divorce? If there is a fix, what is it? And finally, uh, I want you to pay attention now for just a few minutes to get caught up on some of the latest news. And I found this particularly interesting. Um, and so I wanted to include it here in this webinar. So uh, watch your screens for me, please. I'm gonna share a very brief video with you. Uh, that uh, talks about what's happening today. You've probably seen the jokes on social media about how after the coronavirus epidemic is over, birth rates and divorce rates are going to go up. Well, the fact is divorce rates do go up after periods of family time, like after the holidays. And divorce attorneys say they expect an onslaught when this is all over. Business is booming right now for Eleanor Alter, a prominent divorce lawyer in the epicenter of the pandemic, New York City. I'm seeing an uptick in calls. And she's not alone. A lot of family law attorneys are telling the New York Post that divorces are skyrocketing. Millions of families across the USA are sheltering in place and they're spending a lot of time together. But instead of bringing them closer, some married couples are saying it's time, at least when the crisis is over, to go their separate ways and file for divorce. After the holidays and the end of summer, there is a spike in uh, people contacting lawyers for divorce. Part of it is the kind of too much togetherness. Family therapist Melissa Chuin says the coronavirus crisis is causing husband and wives to make big decisions about their future. I do believe that this is the straw that broke the camel's back for a lot of couples, unfortunately. And a lot of it has to do with the lack of communication that they have in their relationship and the inability to seek help when they needed it, especially during these times. And when it comes to divorce among the uber rich, the sagging economy is also spurring the path to Splitsville. Certainly assets have gone down in value, but that's only a piece of it. 
So there you have it, a very quick news item. Um, so we are seeing, uh, and then it is projected that we will see an increase in filings for, uh, for divorce because so many individuals have been quarantined and spending more time together than they usually do. Let me say this very quickly and very, uh, as, 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 as clearly and as strongly as I can. Divorce is not the problem. Divorce is not the problem. The problem is the kinds of things that tend to contribute to divorce. And so even as we deal with this quarantine, and as was said, even in that brief video clip, that what individuals are experiencing having been quarantined together, it is a magnification of the kinds of challenges that have really have already existed, that pre-existed in the relationships. And so one of a couple of things have happened here with the uh, with 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 quarantine uh, as a as as a function of uh, COVID nineteen, it is nothing more than an injection of dye into the veins, so to speak, so that it is revealing it is revealing what relationships were like all along. So what we're finding is that for relationships that were doing well under quarantine, they in fact got better, and for and for relationships that were not doing so well under quarantine they got progressively worse. And the data is going to bear that out in time. So it'll be interesting to look at another several months after researchers have collected the data to see um, what kinds of facts are being presented. So, but this webinar is going to address the issue of what are those materials that tend to contribute to divorce-like thinking and subsequently divorce behavior? What are the materials that tend to contribute to strengthening relationships so that divorce uh, is not evident? So that's what we want to focus on here. But before I dive into that directly, um, I want to share with you some data from research that was done quite some time ago, the decline of marriage and the rise of new families. I'm going to guess that most of you are not familiar with this Pew research that was done um, more than 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, this research was done. And back in that time, it revealed some things that was happening in this thing called marriage. And so I put a snippet or two together so you can uh, just for context, see what has been happening for quite some time and perhaps, perhaps is continuing. So follow as I read. Over the past 50 years, a quiet revolution has taken place in this country. Decades of demographic, economic, and social change have transformed the structure and composition of the American family. The preeminent family unit of the mid 20th century, mom, dad, and the kids no longer has the stage to itself. A variety of new arrangements have emerged, giving rise to a broader and evolving definition of what constitutes a family. At the center of this transformation is the shrinking institution of marriage. In 1960, 72% of American adults were married. By 2008, that share had fallen to 52%. Part of this decline is explained by the fact that the average age at which men and women First marriage is now the highest ever recorded, having risen by roughly five years in the past half century. Part of the decline is attributable to the near tripling in the share of currently divorced or separated to 14% in 2008 from 5% in 1960. Public attitudes toward marriage reflect these dramatic changes. When asked in the new survey if marriage is becoming obsolete, about four in 10 Americans, 39%, say that it is. In a survey of voters conducted by Time Magazine in 1978, when the divorce rate in this country was near an all time high, just 28% agreed that marriage was becoming obsolete. And so I wanna share that with you because that's data. That's data from 2008. And I recall putting my hands on that data some 10 years ago when I was, again, doing a seminar or a workshop. And even then, it was, it, it, it was startling to see this shift. Now, 
uh, if you're interested in getting a hold of that, um, that, that, that data and actually that report, it's a very, very lengthy report, but very, very rich in terms of what has happened uh, with families and what the trends continue uh, to be like even because we're going to look at some of those trends to see whether or not they're continuing. But this issue of difficulties in relationship and the institution of marriage seemingly shrinking and divorce increasing has been taking place from the 1950s, from the 1950s. And here we are now in 2020, 70 years later. The question is, what's happening? Is it still going on in if divorce is still a real thing for us, which it is, is it a problem? And if it is a problem, is there a fix? If there is no problem, then why do we discuss it at all? So what we do see, however, is that there is a decline in divorce. There is a decline in divorce. And there's an article that, uh, that, that, that discusses this that says in so many words, <laughs> divorce is on the decline. And here's a part of the article. In the past 10 years, the percentage of American marriages that end in divorce has fallen. And in a new paper, the University of Maryland sociologist, Philip Colvin, quantified the drop off. Between 2008 and 2016, the divorce rate declined by 18% overall. Wait, you mean divorce is going down? Yeah, yeah. Seemingly, anyway. So this article was written uh, by Joe Pinska. Um, and this was, uh, what, a couple of years ago? September 25th, 20, 2018. And uh, the article was titled, The Not-So-Great Reason Divorce Rates Are Declining. So the question is, do we see a decline in divorce? Yes, the question is why. And that's what he really wanted to address. And so he had reached out to a couple of sociologists, one being Philip Cohen, the other being uh, Andrew Cherlin and uh, share that information with you. Second, and so the question is, is divorce on the decline? Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not on the decline. Maybe what we see is just a delay, not a decline. I think that's a much more accurate picture. So it's not that divorce is declining as much as divorces are being delayed. Well, why is that the case? Well. Here is Pinsker once again, because in his article, here's what he continued to discuss. I asked Andrew Cherlin, a sociology professor at Johns Hopkins University, how to make sense of this trend. He opened his explanation with somewhat of a comb. In order to get divorced, he said, you have to get married first. And that's it. But he goes on. That in the late 1970s, when he received his PhD, it was widely expected among researchers that the divorce rate would continue to rise. But it has. And what's behind this unforeseen development is the decline in marriage, corresponding rise in cohabitation among Americans with less education. There it is, ladies and gentlemen. So it's not really a decline. It's a delay. But what we also see in the, in the delay of divorce is an increase in cohabitation. Here's a little bit more. He goes on. So looking at married couples alone doesn't capture the true nature of American partnerships today. If you were to include cohabiting relationships in addition to marriages, the breakup rates for young adults have probably not been going down, Sherlin says. In other words, yes, divorce rates are declining, but that's more a reflection of who's getting married than the stability of any given American couple. And ladies and gentlemen, that's the issue that I want to address here for just a second. Because whether it's marriage or divorce or it's cohabitation, the heart of the issue is to what degree are we seeing stability in our society as a function of relationships? And what we're seeing more often than not is that less and less families or more and more families are less stable more and more families are less stable and a part of that has to do with new arrangements that are new living arrangements that are being made but not just because there are new living arrangements and 
arrangements like cohabitation. What we continue to see is that even though individuals are being more educated, particularly women in our society, women are getting college degrees at a faster rate, but the education has to do more with career than anything else. But the education that we really need to be paying attention to in our families is how to bolster and strengthen our families. How do we remain together? How do we learn to live together successfully so that we do not succumb and we are not made more susceptible to things like even separation and then divorce? How do we do that? And seemingly as much education as we, 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 we are getting, it seems that the wiser that we are getting, the weaker that we are becoming. And this is not a very, very good thing. Right? Now, there's a reason why all of these things are happening. And I want to say a little bit more about that uh, just here in a minute. But let's address the issue of the increase in cohabitation. Because in, in a few more articles, part of it, again, Pew Research, as marriage rates have fallen, the number of US adults in cohabiting relationships has continued to climb, reaching about 18 million in 2016. This is up 29% since 2007, when 14 million adults were cohabiting, according to US Census Bureau data. Roughly half of cohabitors, those living with an unmarried partner, are younger than 35. But an increasing number of American ages 50 and older are in the cohabiting relationships, according to a new Pew Research Center analysis of the current population survey. In fact, cohabitors ages 50 and older represented about a quarter, 23% of all cohabiting adults in 2016. Since 2007, the number of cohabiting adults ages 50 and older grew by 75%. This increases faster than that of other age groups during this time period and is driven in part by the aging of baby boomers. In 2016, 4 million adults ages 15 and older were cohabiting, up from 2.3 million in 2007. By comparison, 8.9 million adults ages 18 to 34 were cohabiting last year, up from 7.2 million. What's going on? And what we see is that while there seems to be a decline in divorce, there is an uptick in cohabitation. Once again, look at that graph. And so it says right here, since 2007, the number of cohabiting adults ages 50 and older has risen. So look down, I'm sorry. I need to change that. Look down here for me, please. So. So 2007, 9, 11, 13, 16, same numbers here. So, so we look at 18 to 34, 2007, 7.2 million. 2016, 8.9, 24% increase. 35 to 49, 2007, 3.9, 2016, 4.7, 20% increase. 15 old is the largest increase. We need to try to understand what's going on here. The older we get, the more we move away from marriage towards cohabitation, then maybe marriage doesn't work. Maybe marriage isn't working. Maybe it was never intended to work. Now, I don't believe that, but I wanted to pose that just as questions because it seems that at 50 plus, as we get older, we would be wiser but something is happening and the question is what? Because in 2007, we go from 2.3 to almost double that, almost double, almost 100% increase, 4.0 in 2016. So what do you make of that? Where's all of this coming from? What do we do with that? Well, answers in just a minute. Let's go back to the Pew Research uh, Center um, survey that was done in 2008. Let me also say this. This year is another time, this is, this is 2020, and so the census, the 
the census is being taken this year. In about another year or two, we're going to get brand new data on these kinds of trends that have been happening. And so perhaps I will, I will, I will come back in another year or so and um, visit this topic again to see if this trend continues in this upward trajectory in terms of cohabitation while, while divorce seems to be declining and marriage itself is um, also uh, declining. But let's have a quick look here at what this article, the, another part of this article is saying, particularly in reference to the Not all of the survey findings are harbingers of gloom and doom for the institution of marriage. Even among those who are not currently married, getting hitched continues to have appeal. Majority of adults believe that in many key realms of life, such as finding happiness, getting ahead in a career, or having social status, it doesn't make any difference whether a person is married or single. However, among those who believe it does make a difference, most say that being married is better. And so let's have a look at the data because that statement comes from somewhere. This is the way we do research. We will, we will survey thousands upon thousands of individuals as we begin to look at these different kinds of questions and institutions and, and value systems that we have. We want to know what's going on in our world. So we conduct very, very large scale surveys. It takes a long time to do that, collect the information, analyze it. Here's what we found. So when, 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 when you look particularly at this survey, the question was asked, do you want to get married? Percentage of unmarried saying whether or not they want to get married. So have a look at the data. Want to marry? The aggregate, everyone in total is 46%. It's less than 50%. Those living with a partner, those cohabiting, says at a rate of 64% I want to marry. Those who are single at a rate of 58% say I want to marry. Those who are divorced or widowed, they are all the way down here, 22%. Why is that? Why is it that, 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 that single whether partnered or not, want to jump in. But those who were in and got out says, nah, been there, done that, don't want to do it again. Something isn't right. We're doing something wrong, I can tell you. All right? So I want to focus particularly on those two numbers you see highlighted right there. Living with a partner who want to marry, 64%. And single who want to marry, 58%. Percent. So let me discuss that a little bit more, particularly under uh, this topic of the materials and the myths of divorce. I'm going to share a, a, a video with you. And after that video, I'm going to come back and tease out the points that were made, basically literally the same points, and just add some flesh to the bones, if you may. Um, but I want you to pay close attention. And, 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 and let me also say that as this video begins, um, th this, this, this presenter is just making a list of things without saying in the beginning, hey, if you want to divorce, do these things. But that's in essence what this video is really saying, okay? That if you want to divorce, here are the things that you should do. But I wanted to give you a heads up on that because um, the presenter really doesn't, all they do is list these things. So here we go. Have a challenging childhood with unreliable, reckless, or scary parents. Then try never to think about, understand, or digest what you've been through. Grow up into an extremely romantic person with a firm conviction that there is someone out there who will entirely understand and heal the broken parts of you. Foster a faith in the one, an angel in human form. Dismiss a lot of candidates with healthy emotional backgrounds by saying that they are boring. Head for someone with similarly grave psychological wounds, but far more importantly, with an equal commitment to not understanding themselves. Spend a lot of money on a huge wedding. Think at length about seating plans and flowers. Don't go anywhere near a marriage therapist. Acquire some distinctive communication skills, where when you are annoyed, you don't really let on maybe drink or chop wood instead. 
Ask yourself if it's normal to be a bit unhappy with someone sometimes and answer with a firm no. Trust that life for others is a bed of roses. Feel very justified in your own positions. Nurture self-righteousness. Stick to your guns. Be very insistent and keen on identifying your partner's wrongdoings. Become a forensic expert in their flaws. Adopt a general line that it's always the other person's fault. Be very good at explaining why criticism of you is misguided and cruel. Always believe that any feedback about you is malevolent. Insist that love is about accepting the whole of you, every single bit. Always measure your current sentiment against the happiest day of your honeymoon and be very good at noting how far it's fallen. Carefully compare your daily experience with the media representations of newly engaged celebrities. Draw frequent attention to the aging process as it affects your partner. Blame them for not taking care of themselves enough. Frequently identify people in the street with whom you might be much happier. Point them out to your partner. Watch a lot of porn and judge your own sexual life by comparison. Notice how many disappointing characteristics in your own children are the fault of your partner and your partner's family. Draw enormous inferences from your partner's irritating quirks of behavior around the kitchen and bathroom. Often ruminate on what potential damage your partner could have done to your career. Take your anger and disappointment with your partner and direct it towards having an affair. Argue that divorce is just an accident, means nothing, and that children won't mind. Get a divorce, remarry, add tears, start again. Okay, so let me basically go over those same points again and just add a bit of commentary. Now, one of the reasons I uh, add these videos to to the webinar it is because the webinar is recorded. And for those of you who end up getting the link, you can archive it and go back and review it and review it and reflect upon it because there will be suggestions and recommendations in these webinars, the kinds of things that can be done to, to, to strengthen and enrich relationships. So let me begin here with the materials of divorce. And, 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 and by materials, what I mean is things that contribute to or play a role in divorce. Some of these are things that a person inherited, in parentheses, right? Inherited through experiences and parents and or culture. So all of us, when we come into this world, we come into this world in a family system. And the truth is that all family systems are dysfunctional. That's hard for most people to accept, but all family systems are dysfunctional. All family systems are also functional, but not all are dysfunctional or functional in the same way, at the same time, to the same degree, with the same thing. And that's what's going to be important here. So even when we come into families, and even when families are well-intentioned, things happen in the developmental process that shape the way we think about relationships, some for good and some for not so good. And so let's look at some of these materials that we inherit or we build on our own over a period of time. So first, I put in the category of dismiss, deny, and dodge. Have a challenging childhood with unreliable, reckless, or scary parents. Then try to think and or, or digest what you've been through, right? So the, the, or it's actually then try never to think. Let me do that again. Have a, child, have a challenging childhood with unreliable, reckless, or scary parents. Then try never to think about, understand, or digest what you've been through. This is what I refer to as dismiss, deny, and dodge. True of the matter is, once again, we have these kinds of experiences. Not all of us have the same kind of experiences. And even when we have similar experiences, they are still different to certain degrees. 
There's no such thing as a perfect childhood. There's no such thing as a perfect parent. And so we, we, we all come into adulthood with a certain degree of baggage. I tell the joke sometime uh, to my daughters that I hope when their mom and I pass on that they inherit uh, some kind or they, they, they get some kind of financial inheritance, right? So that, that, that either from uh, life insurance that we now have that they can inherit or uh, the two dollars that we will leave in the bank or some sort, hopefully there will be something. But even if that doesn't happen, that their mom and I have already set aside a special account to be touched for one reason and one reason only. So that when they get into adulthood and they begin to feel like they were shortchanged or cheated or, or, or something happened to them because of their parents, they should go into that account and take the few dollars that are there and find a good psychologist to work through their issues. Because none of us are perfect. Even the best of parents, even those of us who are trained in mental health, even those of us who are trained as helping professionals, we don't get it all right all the time. And so the truth of the matter is all of us come into adult relationships in kind of a frayed, if not broken way. And the worst that we can ever do is dismiss those realities, deny them or dodge them. It only makes things progressively worse. Let's go next. So continue to deny, dismiss and dodge. Dismiss a lot of candidates with healthy emotional backgrounds saying that they are boring. Head for someone with similarly grave psychological wounds, but far more importantly, with an equal commitment to not understanding themselves. This is crazy. We do this all the time. And one of the, the, the mistakes that we have made is that we tend to believe that we have to marry or be with someone with all of these similarities like uh, ethnicity and 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 from the same country, speak the same language, and on and on and on and on. The truth of the matter is, the vast majority of those things really do not matter, really do not matter. Because two human beings from any kind of background can make a, relation work, uh, make a relationship work if they want it to work. Now, people may have their preferences. They may have their preference uh, ethnically. They may have their preference racially. They may have their preference uh, academically, socioeconomic. It's okay to have your preference. There's nothing wrong with preferences. But to select your preference based purely on the idea that you have to be with this person because of their race or their ethnicity or because they are a college graduate or not a college graduate, rather than looking at your own brokenness first and then that other person saying, okay, what am I doing to fix me? And what is that person doing to fix them? Because if we don't do something about that, it's going to create some problems. And unfortunately, what happens is that, particularly for singles and cohabiting adults who come into relationships, they do not pay attention to these kinds of things. If you're single and you're cohabiting and you're not paying attention to your own brokenness or that of the person you are living with or dating or plan to marry, something is going to happen that's not going to end up very good because you are dismissing, denying, and, and dodging some very, very serious realities here. Next, dismiss, deny, and dodge. Acquire some distinctive communication skills where when you're annoyed, you don't let on. You drink or chop wood instead. It is normal to be a bit unhappy with someone sometimes and ask the farm no. Again, this is crazy. This is crazy. So, so, so we work really hard. We work really hard at not saying things that really need to be said. And quite frankly, sometimes we're told, well, you really don't want to say anything to your partner because you want to keep the peace. And while that has a certain degree of wisdom to it at certain times, the truth of the matter is, if you cannot share with your spouse, your partner, things that really need to be addressed, particularly in them, then that's a problem. Now, listen to me very carefully, because it is easy for us to want to talk to someone about things that need to be addressed in them. And here's my question to you. If you're talking to someone to address things in them, are you doing that for them or are you doing it for you? 
one more time. If you're talking to someone so that they would address things in them, are you doing it for them or are you doing it for you? If you're doing it for them, great. If you're doing it for you, that's a problem. That's a problem. Because our focus really needs to be on looking at the other person's best interest first. What's in their own best interest? And to the degree that that person now is being told about what's in their own best interest, and then they want to work on that or deal with that thing, we then become the recipient of the better person that they have become. But in our selfishness, what we tend to want to do is to want people to get better for us. That is purely selfish and doesn't work. People see right through it and it creates major, major problems. But in addition to that, so the next part of this, ask yourself if it's normal to be a bit unhappy with someone sometimes and answer with a firm no. We all are unhappy with other people at some times and it's okay to say yes. It's okay to say yes. But once again, when we are unhappy with someone, we need to find out whether or not our unhappiness with them or wanting them or even in our drive to be happier with them is something we really need to deal with. This idea of trying to fix people is problematic and we need to get out of that business. Come on, we gotta go. So next, this next category, I refer to it as do your ABCs, accuse, blame, and criticize. The point made was be very insistent and keen on identifying your partner's wrongdoings. Become a forensic expert in their flaws. Adopt the general line that it's always the other person's fault. Not too much commentary is needed for that. that that's, that's not good. The idea of accusing, blaming, and criticizing, really no one wants to be around that. And if they do, that's a problem. That's a problem. Because it means that in the crevices of their mind, that is what they have become accustomed to. And if they are craving for accusation or blame or criticism, they, they, then they are very, very broken. But most people don't want that. Most people do. What we do in many instances, we end up being the accusers. We end up being the ones to blame. We end up being the ones to criticize because there's something very broken and flawed within us that really needs to be addressed. Next, reflect. Always measure your current sentiment against the happiest day of your honeymoon and be very good at noting how far it's fallen. Carefully compare your daily experience with media representations of the newly engaged celebrities. This is a problem. This is, where we, this, is, this is where we began to say, you know what, when, when we first got married, things were great. Things were great. The truth of the matter is, for the vast majority of people who marry, they marry on the basis of romantic love, which is, it's unsustainable. And so for that reason, reality sets in, and when it does, it becomes easy to reflect on that romantic period and say, you know what, you change. The truth of the matter is, <laughs> there was no change. That was just a put on for a long time. In one of these webinars, I will address the issue of limerence. Limerence is what we tend to experience from anywhere from the first 18 months to the first 36 months of a relationship where everything is great. Life is wonderful. The other person just walks on water. Heaven is missing an age. They can do absolutely nothing wrong. And then all of a sudden, reality sets in. Limerence is a function of romantic kind of thinking. And as I've said in the past, and I will address it again in another webinar or something, romance isn't real. It never was real. Go back and look at the history from 900 years ago. Romance was a, was a, was a fictitious language that was created to do nothing more than entertain. And anytime we get caught up in the romantic kind of thinking, as I said in another webinar previously, it's okay to be romantic, but to recognize that it has its limitations, but only for a period. But when we want to live in the romantic narrative forever and ever, and we begin to reflect, there's only one other option, and that is to also regret. So if you want to reflect and regret, that's a good step to divorce. By the way, I'm not suggesting that you do that, okay? Just to be clear. Next, behave badly. Out of porn and judge your own sexual life by comparison. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I can spend the next webinar or two addressing the issue 
a poem. I'm going to try to do it here in 60 seconds. And of course, I won't do it justice. But porn is becoming more and more pervasive in relationships, more and more pervasive. And there's a misunderstanding generally about why people tend to indulge in pornography. So one thinking, one school of thought is that, well, individuals do it because they want something that they cannot have or they're just wishing that they did have. And while that might be true, that's not the leading thought. The leading thought is that many people who continuously participate in pornographic material is individuals who was look, individuals who are looking to feel a sensation of some kind. In many instances, wherever there's porn present in a relationship, there, there's also the absence of sensitivity and warmth and compassion and tenderness and kindness. And so a lot of individuals who will then turn to porn to look for a physical sensation to try to create those feelings that perhaps they would get. Not necessarily sexual feelings also, but we need to address this at some point because porn is a, it is a huge, huge problem. And by the way, by the way, not just for males, not just for males. It is becoming more and more of a problem for females as well. But let me push. Behave badly and justify it. Take your anger and disappointment with your partner and direct it towards having an affair. Argue that divorce is an accident, means nothing, and the children won't mind. This is absolutely not true. So let me very quickly address this issue. If you are currently having an affair, you're blaming your partner or spouse for that, they're not the blame. You do what you do because that's what you want to do. If you have ever had an affair, no one forced you to do that. You did that because that's what you wanted to do. If you are thinking about having an affair, it is what you are wanting to do. It becomes very easy. Again, go back a couple of slides where I said, accuse, blame, and criticize. It becomes very easy for us to blame others for our bad behavior. The truth of the matter is, people do what they want to do. Now, are there things that a partner might do that contribute to someone doing something that maybe they should not do? Yes, that's very true and very real. Contribute, yes. Cause, no. And there's the difference. Contribute, yes. Cause, no. Because someone might nudge. Someone might nudge. But pushing you over the side? No. You weren't pushed over the side, you jumped. You may have been pushed close to the edge, but you jumped. So, so again, let's get out of the idea that we can justify bad, no matter what kind of bad behavior it is. In this particular instance, we're talking about extramarital affairs. But for you to speak to your spouse unkindly or to your partner unkindly, to treat them psychologically, me, that's not right. It just isn't right. And those are the kinds of things, again, that would contribute to divorce. But let's have a look now at the myths of divorce. These are the things that encourage and promote a divorce mindset. Again, the thinking about divorce, the kind of mindset that says, yeah, divorce is really a good idea. It's a good option here. Now, again, to be clear, not everyone thinks like that. And when people get to that point, um, they, they but there's a certain kind of um, thinking that goes into creating a mindset for or of divorce. They often swing in the polar opposite direction of the materials that we just discussed that contribute to or play a role in divorce and therefore tend to have a fairy tale and unrealistic quality. Again, the myths. The myths are these fairy tale and unrealistic kinds of things about divorce that we tend to conjure up in our mind. Here they are. Find the perfect partner. 
into an extremely romantic person with a firm conviction that there's someone out there who will entirely understand and heal the broken parts of you. Foster faith in the one, an angel in human form. There is no such thing as a soulmate, ladies and gentlemen. Now, if that strikes you as odd or controversial, I'm going to have to let that sit for right now. But the truth of the matter is, no single person in this world has been created or evolved just for you, nor you for anyone else. The truth of the matter is, we tend to want to believe that because we want to feel special. We want to feel like someone, someone just out of the blue was, just came along for us. That simply is not true. There's no perfect partner. Great relationships are fostered and forged over time. It takes work and effort. And so what tends to happen is that when we, when we grow up as children, with these dysfunctional kinds of systems that we have inherited, we then look in adulthood for someone to bail us out of that. And then when we see someone who seems to fit the bill, we lock on. And when we lock on, the truth of the matter is, both that person and us are in trouble because now we begin to hold that person prisoner. We hold them hostage because we think this is the perfect one. That's a problem, that's a problem. Next. Dive deeper into dysfunctional thinking. How do we do that? Spend a lot of money on a huge wedding. Think at length about seeding plants and flowers. Don't go anywhere near a marriage therapist. Trust that your life for others, or trust, trust that life for others is a bed of roses. Feel very justified in your own positions. Nurture self-righteousness and stick to your guns. Again, I could spend an entire webinar just on this one point or just on these two or three points right here. Marriages and wedding ceremonies are becoming more and more and more expensive, more and more and more outlandish. And the research is showing that the average wedding right now is costing somewhere between twenty-five dollars and $30,000, taking the average person or the average couple five years to pay it off. And in many instances, within the time that they are paying off the wedding bill, they're also considering paying the lawyer for divorce. This is crazy. This is crazy, right? So here's my recommendation. Here's my recommendation. A very, very small wedding, almost free of charge. Try to do the smallest that you possibly can for the least price that you possibly can. So what would be really good in weddings is things like really good pictures because the pictures create the memories that you want to hold on to for quite some time. Small gathering with close friends and relatives and great time together. Keep it really, really, in fact, pay for it cash. That's a good rule of thumb, pay for it. If you can't pay for it cash, then you really can't afford it. You really can't afford it, right? But the idea here, particularly as it lends to divorce, is, is this myth, this myth that you're going to have this really, really large wedding where you focus on a whole lot of extraneous and external plans. And then the thing that you're going to ignore most is marriage coaching or counseling. This is a huge mistake, huge mistake. Because unfortunately, again, what happens is that individuals who are dating and getting ready to marry, they're not thinking about the things that have already gone wrong or could possibly go wrong. They're not thinking about planning. And so for that reason, they don't see any problems on down the road. Why would they need a th You only go to a therapist if you have a problem, right? Right. Well, no, no. Do you go to school only because you have a problem? No, you go to school to educate yourself, to, 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 to stave off the problems that can come as a result of things like unemployment. So, Getting a therapist, getting a coach, getting a psychologist, getting a psychotherapist, getting a counselor well in advance of getting married is the secret, is the secret. I've had the good pleasure in the four, four, five years that I've been here, in the four years that I've been at Miami-Dade College to actually perform um, two wedding ceremonies for um, students of mine, students of mine. And here was the, re the requirement. 
if Dr. Hasty is going to provide, or if, if Dr. Hasty is going to officiate your wedding, you first have to undergo six months of premarital coaching. Other than that, him not going to do it. Him not going to do it. And over that six-month period, he will put you through the strictures of really thinking in very thoughtful and deliberate ways about this great institution called marriage. And more and more individuals need to consider that. More people would spend much more money on their one day of wedding rather than investing in good counseling so that their marriage can last for a lifetime. I stop right there because, again, that's, that's, that's a topic that can go uh, for, um, for quite some time. Next, become super sensitive. Be very good at explaining why criticism of you is misguided and cruel. Always believe that any feedback about you is mean. Insist that love is about accepting the whole of you, every single bit. Again, the point that your presenter made in the video is go ahead and do this if you really want a divorce. The idea that there's really nothing about us that, that, that can use adjustment, that if someone says something to us, they, they, they mean us ill, and that if you really love me, you will love all of me. That is not, that is nonsense. That is not true. It simply is not true. None of us is perfect. None of us is that good particularly those of us who call ourselves Christians, only God is good like that. And we strive to be like that. And a part of striving to be like that, we learn about the kinds of things that we need to work on. Patience and kindness and gentleness and givingness and forgiveness. That's a daily undertaking. And just to do that for ourselves, by ourselves, is enough. But to be able to do that with someone else, then even becomes much more of a challenge. And so peel back on the on the sensitivity. Don't be so shallow. If someone really wants to be with you, why would you think that they would be out to get you? Those are the kinds of stinking thinking, as I call it, that pervades relationships that ultimately would lead to divorce. Very quickly, we gotta go. Pretend to be secure. Draw frequent attention to the aging process as it affects your partner. Blame them for not taking care of themselves. You know, frequently identify people in the street with whom you might be much happier. Point them out to your partner. That is the very epitome of insecurity. Insecure. We all age. We all get older. Just recently, I celebrated my 60th birthday. If you were to look at a picture of me at 16 years of age, it would look very different. My skin would look a little bit tighter. I would have a little bit more hair. No, I take that back. Okay, so I haven't been able to have a haircut. And this, is the, this is the longest my hair has been in a quarter of a century, 25 years. But I used to have less of a receding hairline. We all change, we change physically. But what should also happen is that we should change emotionally and psychologically, we should get better with that. So even as we get older, we should get better. And for us to pretend that that is not true, it doesn't happen, simply is not real. I like the song, and I made reference to this in another webinar. I like the song that um, Randy Travis, country singer Randy Travis, uh, made popular several years ago. I will love you forever, amen. And one of the lines in that song that I really like, he says, listen, I'm gonna love you even when your hair turns from brown to gray. In fact, when it all falls out, I'm still gonna love you, why? I didn't marry you for your hair. And so the, 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 the idea of coming into relationship, just as I said in the last seminar, we don't do, we, we, we don't marry for love. We don't marry for children. We don't marry for riches. We don't marry for property. What we marry for is companionship. And in healthy, good relationships, that companionship gets nurtured over time. It gets better and better over time. But if it doesn't, and if you pretend to be secure when in fact you're insecure, that creates a problem. Next, pretend to be perfect. 
Notice how many disappointing characteristics in your own children are the fault of your partner, your partner's family. Draw enormous inferences from your partner's irritating quirks of behavior around the kitchen and bathroom. Often ruminate what potential damage your partner could have done to your career. See, now this I understand completely. I mean, my two beautiful daughters are also pretty. They are because of me, purely. I mean, their mama has given them absolutely nothing. She has offered them absolute, but for me, they would just be miserable folk all the time. Did that make any sense? No, it doesn't make sense. But yet in our minds, we would say those kinds of things, and even worse, we would tend to believe it. True of the matter is, our kids are a function, in part, of both parents, and then after a while, who they really want to be. Kids can only blame their parents for who they are up to a certain point. And yes, there are idiosyncrasies, there are quirks and cracks and quirks that our spouses and our partners have. They irritate us. But to focus on them and to tease them out and to put a magnifying glass on them will eventually lead to divorce. Mets. To the dance. This is the point that your author, uh, your presenter made in the video. Get a divorce. Get a divorce, remarry, add tears, start again. And the reason he said that is because when we look at the numbers behind the narrative, especially when it, as it relates to marriage, divorce, and remarriage, here are the numbers. 50% of all first-time marriages end in divorce. Many of those individuals who divorce will marry for a second time. When they do, 65% of them will divorce. And when they divorce, many of them will marry for a third time. And when they do, 75% of them will divorce. But wait, wait. If you are remarrying, shouldn't you get better with practice? This data doesn't suggest that at all. This doesn't suggest that. And so often when I'm teaching the class in marriage and family, and I ask my, and I, share this data with my students and I say to them, what do you make of this data? And sometimes they would say, professor, <laughs> marriage doesn't work. Marriage doesn't work. If someone is married and they get divorced and then they marry and then divorce for a second time at a higher rate and then they divorce and marry for a third time and divorce at a higher rate, marriage doesn't work. And I said, that's an interesting read on the data. That's certainly one read. That's one perspective. Here's my perspective. People want to be married. People want to be married. And that data is borne out by what we saw in the survey where the data was collected more than 10 years ago. People want to be married. The challenge is people don't know how to stay married. And the reason we don't know how to stay married is because in many instances, our own selfishness will drive us to the point of divorce. Is that always the case? No. But more often than not, it is. We human beings are selfish. We are inherently selfish. We are raised in many ways to be selfish. And if you can hear yourself say, I'm not selfish, let me tell you how. That's because you are selfish. The truth of the matter is, the more that we begin to accept and embrace the fact that we are selfish, the easier it becomes for us to work on becoming selfless. And that's my challenge to you. That's my challenge to you. So, is divorce ever justified? Are there times you should ever get divorced? The answer is simply yes. I don't believe that, 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 that no one should ever divorce. Even for those who are conservative. And by the way, I'm, 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 I'm conservative Christian. Where, where I was raised to believe and actually used to stand in the pulpit and preach that but for sexual infidelity or marital infidelity, you really should not divorce. I've changed my view on that. Changed my view. Not that I become more liberal. But my view is that if you're in a relationship, not just married, but if you're in a partnered relationship and you are being physically abused, get out, get out. Now, does it mean that if you get out that you necessarily have to divorce? No, no. You may want to work on some things, but don't stay there and take a beating. 
whether you're male or female. And by the way, if you don't know, males are physically abused at an even higher rate, if not equally rate, as females. We don't hear of it because, you know, it wouldn't be very manly to share that information, right? You're going to go to the police station or go to the precinct and say, my wife or my partner just, just beat me up. Fellas, get around. Gather around. This guy is saying, woman, just beat the daylights out of him. Boy, what's wrong with you? And unfortunately, he now has to deal with the shame of that. But it's very, very real. And so most men do not report that because that's not the manly thing to do. But it happens. So here's my point. If you're in a relationship, in a marriage, on a partner relationship, dating relationship, and you're being physically abused, get out. Get out. It's not always easy. Because in your mind, you have told yourself, unfortunately, in many instances, perhaps you deserve it because you were behaving badly. Perhaps you deserve it because your parents or someone in your developmental uh, trajectory always said that you were ugly or dumb or stupid or didn't deserve it. If someone mistreated you, you deserve it because you brought it on yourself. This is nonsense. Absolute nonsense. And so is there ever a place for divorce? Yes, there is. If there's psychological and emotional abuse, Deal with that. And if you have to separate for a while, while that gets addressed, separate, separate. Do not stay in a relationship where you're constantly being pounded upon. But does that also mean that you should very lightly enter the thing called divorce? Absolutely no. I don't think you should. Divorce has some very, very heavy consequences. You'll see in just a minute. We got to go. So what's the fix? Very quickly, we're way over time. Thank you for being patient. If you have to go, I understand completely, but it's recording. And so you'll have access to the recording. We still have at least another 10 minutes here. So what's the fix? I'm gonna share with you very quickly two videos in succession to address the fix. And then I'm gonna open it up for questions um, if you have questions at that point. So watch these videos in succession for me, please. They really address uh, the fix. The idea that one is, in many ways, an extremely difficult person to be in a relationship with may sound rather improbable and even at points offensive. Yet fully understanding and readily and graciously admitting to this possibility might be the surest way of making sure one is an endurable proposition over the long term. There are few people more deeply insufferable than those who don't, at regular intervals, suspect they might be so. We are, all of us, invariably, hugely tricky characters. We don't need to know anyone in particular to know this about everyone. We have all, in some way or another, been inadequately parented. We have a panoply of unfortunate psychological traits. We're beset by bad habits. We're anxious, jealous, ill-tempered and vain. We are bringing an awesome amount of trouble into someone else's life by agreeing to be their partner. We tend to be shielded from this unwelcome news prior to a big relationship through a mixture of sentimentality and neglect. Our parents loved us too much to tell us. Our friends don't want to get bogged down in detailed critiques of our personalities. A pleasant occasional meal is all they want from us. And our exes were too keen to escape from us to offer up a helpfully detailed critique of our personalities. They simply told us they needed a little bit more space or needed to take a long trip to India. Furthermore, when we're on our own, we just don't notice how annoying we might well be in the eyes of others. Perhaps we were in a sulk for the whole of Sunday, but no one was there to be driven crazy by our self-pity and our passive fury. We may have tendencies to use our work as an escape from intimacy. But so long as we're not permanently with someone, we can pass off our eccentric hours without comment. Our peculiar eating habits won't be real until there is another person across the table to register our challenging chewing sounds and ingredient combinations. Eventually, a partner will call us out on these traits. It feels like a horrible personal attack, which a nicer person wouldn't put us through. But it's no such thing. It's an inevitable response to our failings, which anyone would need eventually to bring up. Our partner is not really doing anything odd. They're merely holding up a mirror. Everyone seen close up has an appalling amount wrong with their characters. It's not us, it's the human condition. The specifics vary hugely, of course. People are nightmarish in different ways. But the basic point is there. 
whatever we think or feel about ourselves, we will be revealed as sorely defective upon close-up, prolonged inspection. Sadly, it's not that our partner is being too critical or unusually demanding. They are the bearer of an inevitable bit of bad news, that we are a nightmare. Being asked to acknowledge one's flaws isn't a request to admit something very strange. What would be strange would be to think that one was without major defects. Of course, we have some delightful qualities as well, but it does mean that we are unavoidably going to be very hard for another person to live around. We need, therefore, to ask ourselves in as candid a manner as we can manage what specifically might be slightly crazy or desperate or undeveloped in our characters. Maturity involves having quite a detailed answer to the question, how are you difficult to live with? A presumption of one's own innocence is at the heart of self-righteousness and cruelty. Because our minds may go blank at this point and remember only our tender and beautiful sides, we should lean on a set of prompts. For example, when I'm annoyed, I have a tendency to... When I feel hurt, I... When I'm tired, I... Around money, I can be a bit difficult because... I guess I worry really quite a lot about... I suppose I might be a bit of a handful around sex because... The point of prompting greater awareness of our questionable patterns of behavior isn't to feel guilty or ashamed about them, just to see how easily they could be confusing, disturbing, and annoying to another person. We need, before we commit ourselves to a relationship, to get fully acquainted with all the ways in which we are going to be a serious challenge to live around. Our relationship reboot cards inspire conversations that can help to rekindle love between you and your partner. Here's the next. One of the great intellectual puzzles that daily life forces all of us to consider on a slightly too regular basis is why are other people so awful? How come they're so unreliable, aggressive, deceitful, mean, two-faced or cowardly? As we search for answers, we tend, quite naturally, to fall back on a standard, compact and tempting explanation. Because they're terrible people. They're appalling, crooked, deformed or bad, and that's simply how some types are. The conclusion may be grim, but it also feels very true and fundamentally unbudgeable. However, when things feel especially clear-cut, we may be goaded to try out an unusual thought experiment, which stands to challenge a great many of our certainties and render the world usefully more complicated. We can try to look at our fellow human beings through the eyes of love. The experiment requires particular stamina and is best attempted at quieter, less agitated times of day. When we manage it, it can count as one of our highest ethical achievements. We are normally resolutely on our own side, deeply invested in our own point of view and prone to trade in settled and moralizing certainties. Yet, very occasionally, we have the strength to look at other people through a different lens. We notice that their reality is likely to be far more complicated and nuanced than we first expected and that contrary to our impulses, they may be deserving of more sympathy and consideration than we thought, even though they might have hurt or frustrated us, even though their behavior might run contrary to what we expect, and even though the temptation is always to call them idiots and numbskulls and move on. Looking at another person through the eyes of love involves some of the following steps. Imagination. Moralistic thinking identifies people closely with their worst moments. Love thinking pushes us in another direction. It bids us to use our imaginations to picture why someone might have done a regrettable deed and yet could remain a fitting target for a degree of understanding and sympathy. Perhaps they got very frightened. Maybe they were under pressure of extreme anxiety or despair. Those who look with love guess that there will be sorrow and regret beneath the furious rantings, or a sense of intolerable vulnerability behind the pomposity and snobbishness. 
They intimate that early trauma and letdown must have formed the backdrop to later transgressions. They will remember that the person before them was once a baby too. The loving interpreter holds on to the idea that sweetness must remain beneath the surface, along with the possibility of remorse and growth. They are committed to mitigating circumstances, to any bits of the truth that could cast a less catastrophic light on folly and nastiness. The child within. To consider others with love means forever remembering the child within them. Our wrongdoer may be fully grown, but their behavior will always be connected up with their early years. We overlook the need occasionally to ignore the outward adult sides of others in order to perceive and sympathize with the angry, confused infant lurking inside. When we're around small children who frustrate us, we don't declare them evil. We don't bear down on them to show how misguided they are. We find less alarming ways of grasping how they've come to say or do certain things. We probably think they're getting a bit tired or their gums are sore or they're upset by the arrival of a younger sibling. We've got a large repertoire of alternative explanations ready in our heads. This is the reverse of what tends to happen around adults. Here we imagine that other people have deliberately got us in their sights. But if we employed the infant model of interpretation, our first assumption would be quite different. Given how immature every adult necessarily remains, some of the moves we execute with relative ease around children must forever continue to be relevant when we're dealing with another grown-up. Patience. Moralistic thinkers reach their certainties swiftly. Love thinkers take their time. They remain serene in the face of obviously unimpressive behavior. A sudden loss of temper, a wild accusation, a very mean remark. They reach instinctively for reasonable explanations and have clearly in their minds the better moments of a currently frantic but essentially lovable person. Redeeming features. Love thinkers interpret everyone as having strengths alongside their obvious weaknesses. When they encounter these weaknesses, they don't conclude that this is all there is. They know that almost everything on the negative side of a ledger could be connected up with something on the positive. They search a little more assiduously than is normal for the strength to which a maddening characteristic must be twinned. We can see easily enough that someone is pedantic and uncompromising, but we tend to forget, at moments of crisis, their thoroughness and honesty. We may know so much about a person's messiness. We forget their uncommon degree of creative enthusiasm. There is no such thing as a person with only strengths, but nor is there someone with only weaknesses. The consolation comes in refusing to view defects in isolation. Love is built out of a constantly renewed renewed and gently resigned awareness that weakness-free people do not exist. We are sinners too. The single greatest spur towards a loving perspective on others is a live awareness that we are also deeply imperfect and at points quite plainly mad. The enemy of generosity is the sense that we might be beyond fault. Whereas love begins when we can acknowledge that we are in equal measures idiotic, mentally wobbly and flawed. It's an implicit faith in their own perfection that turns some people into such harsh judges. Looking at the world through the eyes of love, we're forced to conclude that there is no such thing as a simply bad person and no such thing as a monster. There is only ever pain, anxiety and suffering that have coalesced into unfortunate action. We're not just being kind in this notion. This isn't merely an exercise in being nice. It's an exercise in getting to know the truth of things, which may, when we get down to the details of human psychology, be roughly and almost coincidentally the same thing. Okay, very quickly then. So what are the takeaways? Uh, because there are takeaways that I want you to have. So here they are. Number one, divorce is on the decline, but only same it's more of a delay than it really is a decline. Cohabitation is increasing, but it isn't necessarily a stable living arrangement. I didn't get into great details on the data on how unstable cohabitation can be. Uh, we'll have to get into that uh, another time. 
But as you saw in the data there, even individuals who are cohabiting, what they really want is to marry. Their fear is that the marriage is not going to work. And let me mention one piece of data here that I did not mention earlier. It is generally the case that individuals who cohabit and eventually marry are more likely to divorce within five years after marrying. That is generally true. That isn't true for everyone. That is generally true. And one of the reasons it is, is because when you live with someone without the commitment of marrying, it's easy to have a mindset that says, I'll stay because I can leave anytime. Whereas when you're married, that thinking reverses. And so when you're married, you say, I'll stay. And then you remind yourself, well, you know, there was a time when we were not married and things seemed to be working even better then. They weren't working any better. It only seemed that way. So even though cohabitation is increasing, it isn't necessarily a stable living arrangement, particularly where children are involved. Most people want to marry. The marriage has to get fixed to be more attractive. This is true. And so we see what appears to be a decline in divorce. The truth of the matter is there's a decline in marriage. Why is there a decline in marriage? Because those of us who are married, quite frankly, we have abused the institution of marriage. We've mistreated the institution of marriage. We haven't always held it up to be what it truly can be, a great, great institution that provides comfort and security and protection and love beyond measure. Those are the kinds of things that really should be in marriage. Does it mean that it's always going to be perfect? No, it's not. No, it's not. No one is. And as such, no marriage is perfect. But we forge that path together because we marry for companionship. We want that companionship there to be there until we pass on from this life. Finally, the fix for marriage is introspection, humility, and health. Very quickly. Introspection in as much as we're able to look within us, within ourselves and say, I'm not perfect. I have some flaws. I even have some fractures. Humility, I'm going to ask for help. I'm going to ask for help. I'm going to seek the advice of a counselor. I'm going to seek the advice of a psychotherapist. I'm going to seek the advice of some trained professional in this area. Let me say something here very quickly, you know, because this is a bone of contention for me. Uh, but the vast majority of Christians go to see their priest, their pastor, or their rabbi, when in fact they need to see a psychologist or a counselor. And I find it particularly interesting that in many instances when they're struggling with relationship matters, they go and see the priest, the pastor, or the rabbi. But when they're dealing with physical ailments, they don't want to see the priest, priest the pastor, the, but even if they do, they're going to go and see the physician anyway. We, 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 we are bought into this kind of stinking thinking that priests and pastors and rabbis are also trained counselors and psychologists. They are not. And even those who are, but have not been fully trained and fully credentialed, they simply do not have the background or the skill set to help in the way that it really needs to be helped. And if it sounds like I am preaching for a psychologist, I am because I know it for a fact. I'm a trained preacher, credentialed. I've done it. And in all the training that I've had to become a preacher, all of the training that I got as a counselor, I can fit into a teacup, if that, if that. But as a psychologist, I got kind of training and background that's really needed to help people. So here's my point to you. Do you want to get better in your relationship? Get help. Now, does everyone need deep psychological rescue? Well, yeah. Okay, maybe no. Maybe no. But but get some help because we all have stuff to deal with. The truth of the matter is, in my opinion, everyone needs a psychologist and everyone benefits from a good counselor. But we know that finances and money, that become an issue, but, but do what you can. Again, if you have to spend the money to get that done, then, then do it, because you're going to end up losing more money in other ways in the long run. Okay, I'm off my soapbox in that regard. Listen, we are at the end. We're at the end. Uh, that, that, whoo, that was the longest webinar. I say the longest. That was uh, an hour and 30, 
35 minutes so so far. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I hope you I hope you got something out of it. Thank you for your kindness. I'm going to pause for a minute because uh, you might have uh, some questions. And so if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box uh, so I can see them and I can address them. Uh, but thank you so much, first of all, for your patience um, in, 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 in just working with me through, through that material and your kindness and even wanting, wanting to show up. Again, all of this is being recorded, and so make sure you get the recording. Go back and look at it again and again and again. Discuss it with your partner. Discuss it with your spouse. Use it in your Sunday schools. Uh, use it with your children. Use these materials um, because you will find them to be very, very helpful. At least uh, I think so. Okay, let's open it up for questions and let's see what questions uh, you have. Uh, hang on, let me, I need to, okay, so let me, hang on a second, let me just change. Let me see if those, oops, did I do that right? Okay, so what questions uh, do you have? Uh, let me try again, let's see. Questions, 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 comments, thoughts, any of that. Okay, I'm not seeing any. And so, wait, hang on. Let's see if I'm doing this correctly. Uh, oops, hang on. Chat. Any questions there? Let me see if there are any. Oh, okay, let's see. Here's a question. Did the data explain why cohabited couples that then marry are more likely? Oh, okay, so that question may have come. Yeah, I see that question came earlier. As I mentioned, so, so yes, those who, those who cohabit, they're more likely to divorce because cohabitation gives the wrong impression of marriage. So cohabitation is not a commitment. It seems like a commitment. The truth of the matter is that you're not committed until you're committed. And what happens is that when you make the commitment, things, things change. Psychologically, things change. You, you, you get to a place where you understand, okay, this is permanent. Permanent in as much as I just can't pick up and walk out and because there's another video here and don't have time to show it, wouldn't share it right now anyway talks about one of the reasons we marry. One of the reasons we marry is because we want to get entangled, so to speak, because it is the disentangling. Anyone who's been married, and particularly those who are divorced, know better than those who haven't been divorced, that it is the disentangling. Imagine planting, planting a seed, and then that seed growing into a tree. And then after many years, you pull that tree out of the ground. It's a big gaping hole. It's a big gaping hole. The issue with, by, by comparison with, with, with cohabitation is that it's a kind of tree where the roots just grow right on the top. They never really go into the ground. And so when you take off, it's really no big, big uprooting except where children are involved because they get attached. Okay, so let's see, are there other questions? Okay, I think those are the questions. I don't see anything else. And so that means one of two things. Uh, either you understand it all really well or you don't understand the thing or you're just tired and really need to go. Whatever the case is, listen, I've had a blast. And so uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you so much for your time. Please continue to be safe. 
as so many uh, states uh, beginning to open up and, and, and uh, things are going to change for us all. Uh, but please, please be safe, remain, remain healthy, and stay tuned for the next webinar, which will get announced in about two weeks, and then you will get uh, reminders about that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very kindly. That is it for now. Have a great night and a great time until we meet again. Bye for now.